little bit about drug discovery in Parkinson's. This is classically what big pharmaceutical companies have done and they've tried to find uh, new um, drugs to treat neurodegenerative diseases and Parkinson's and they haven't been successful. So this whole no novel drug discovery pathway at best would take 10 to 20 years and also at best costs in the region of $800 million into the billions of dollars. So a new strategy and a strategy that we're using is drug repurposing and this is really a focus of um, Parkinson's UK strategy moving forward. So what is drug repurposing? So over here is a drug that's gone through that pathway I just illustrated. It's found to act on one target and be beneficial in one particular disease. It's gone through all the safety and the toxicology. It's gone through the clinical trials. It's known to be safe in man. And drug repurposing is then to say, okay, well, can we take that drug and can we see if it will actually act on a different target? A target that we know that goes wrong in our disease. So can it act, for example, on the mitochondria that go wrong in Parkinson's? And therefore, can it be beneficial in a new disease? And by using this strategy, that once you found out that the drug can be beneficial in the new disease, the idea would be that it doesn't have to go through the very long and very expensive toxicology and safety and clinical trials um, because we already know that it is safe for use in man. So what have we already done up until this point? So we've already done a completed drug screen. And for this drug screen, we used skin cells from patients with Parkinson's mutations. So the ones that I was talking to you about in the introduction that show a reduction in mitochondrial function and a reduction in the overall amount of energy produced. We screened 2,000 compounds for a rescue effect on their mitochondria. And then when we found a group of compounds that did rescue the mitochondrial function in the skin cells, we then moved on to look in brain cells grown in the lab in culture from mice to see whether they could also have a rescue effect in brain cells, which is obviously the cells that we need to get the drug to in Parkinson's. And then what we did was we looked to see, are they also active in another group of Parkinson's patients? So as I said, Parkin causes early onset Parkinson's in relatively few people, whereas LARC2 causes later onset Parkinson's and at the moment is the most common known genetic cause. And what we found was that yes, these compounds could rescue the mitochondria in skin cells from patients with LARC2 mutations as well. So I wanted to highlight that there's a promising drug that's come out of this drug screen that we've already done that is in clinical use at the moment for liver disease. It's called UDCA or ursodeoxycholic acid. Uh, and it's been in clinical use for liver disease for a 30 or 40 years. So it's known to be safe and well tolerated in humans. We know the doses that we can give. So one of the things that we're pursuing is trying to get UDCA into a clinical trial to see if it can have a beneficial effect in Parkinson's. And that will be an example of drug repurposing working. But we're also continuing to see if we can find drugs that are actually better than UDCA. So what are we doing now? So the original screen screened 2,000 compounds. And those compounds, not all of them, were already in use in man. In fact, quite a lot of them weren't. So for the new screen, what we're doing is we're only screening drugs which are already in clinical use in man. So we know they've been through the safety and toxicology. And really importantly for Parkinson's, we know that they can get to the brain cells. So that's one of the potential issues with UDCA that I just described. Only very small amounts actually get to the brain cells. So there's more than 14,000 drugs that, can, that are currently used in MAM. However, not all of those are completely separate drugs. Some of them might be uh, that you take a tablet to have to drink with water and it might be the same drug that you have a, as a skin patch. So that number then does actually reduce quite a lot when you take out those different formulations. What we'll do is by screening these drugs for their effect in Parkinson's it should be quicker 
to get the drugs actually to Parkinson's patients, but which can actually get into the brain. So between the brain and the rest of the body, there's a protective barrier called the blood-brain barrier. And what is the blood-brain barrier? So shown here on this schematic is a blood vessel that would be flowing through your brain. And this is will be how the drugs would get into your brain. You would take a tablet uh, and, and the drugs would get into your blood. The blood breast vessels that are in your brain would have the drug in them. Now, surrounding the blood vessel in the brain, there are barrier cells on either side. And then come the actual brain cells and other supporting cells. So, some drugs, like this one here on the left, will simply be too big to fit through those gaps between the barrier cells and not a lot of those would get into the brain cells. Some of them, like this one in black, would be able to change their shape and squeeze through the gaps. Others, like this one in white, are small enough to get through the gaps anyway and lots of them would get into the brain cells. And what I've not shown here as well is that these barrier cells have active transporters that if they like a drug, they can take it from the blood and actively transport it into the brain cells. So what we need to find out with each of the drugs that are used in man at the moment is how much can actually make it from the blood through those barrier cells into the brain cells. Once we've done that and we've ranked them so we know um, how likely they are to get into the brain cells, we then need to um, find a target that we're going to see if they're active against. And tonight you've heard from Amy and myself lots about the mitochondria not working well in Parkinson's. And um, that is certainly one mechanism that goes wrong in Parkinson's. However, there are other mechanisms as well. So for this screen, what we want to do is we want to look at two different mechanisms to see whether we can have a double whammy approach at increasing function of the cells. And the second one is to look at the lysosomes. Now the lysosomes are like the waste disposal roots of the cell. They get rid and recycle anything, be it mitochondria or other proteins that are going wrong in the cell. And so both of these don't work well in Parkinson's. So for this screen, we're looking at two targets. So the actual screen itself is fluorescence based um, and it starts off by looking in skin cells. And you might think, why skin cells? because they're not the cells that go wrong. Well, hopefully, we've convinced you tonight that skin cells, um, definitely the mitochondria do go wrong, and the lysosome or this waste disposal route do go wrong. And importantly, they're actually from the patients. So we can look at different groups. We can look from groups from Parkin mutations, LARC2 mutations, and the largest patient group of all, the sporadic group. So the screen, we stain with three different colors. We stain the nucleus, that Amy talked about having the chromosomes in. We stain the mitochondria, showing their networks here in green. We also stain the lysosomes, which are these blue dots. And then what we can do is we can take this image and we can put it through a computer software program, which can then identify each mitochondria, each lysosome, and also each cell boundary. And then we can get a count how many lysosomes are there in the cells and how uh, bright is the mitochondria staining and that tells us if the mitochondria are functioning well or not. And they will be the readouts that we'll use to see if the drugs can increase the function of the mitochondria and change the number of the lysosomes in each cell. So which cells to look at? So we're using three different patient groups. It's all skin cells taken from patients the first group is from a group with early onset genetically caused Parkinson's, those with Parkin mutations. The next group is the late onset genetically caused Parkinson's, those with the LARC2 mutations. And as I said in the first talk, these groups show much less variability because they're all developing the disease because of the same, uh, the, a change in the same gene. Whereas the last patient group that we're looking at is the sporadic group. And this is the group of patients that we don't know why 
they've developed Parkinson's. But it's the biggest group of patients that we would be hoping to have an effect on. So that is why we've included them in the screen, to see whether at least in their skin cells to start with, the drugs can have a promising effect on the mitochondria and the lysosomes. So when we've done that screen, and that screen is underway in the lab now, what would we need to do next? The screen uses fluorescence, so we need to make sure that the drugs are actually really having a positive effect on the function of the mitochondria, and they're not just interacting with the fluorescent dye that we've used to measure it. So we want to make sure we don't have any false positives in there. And then we need to check if they have a positive effect in brain cells. And we can use this by using two different types of brain cells. We can use brain cells that we can actually make from the same patient's skin cells that we've used in the original screen. So we can take skin cells in the laboratory and we can change them over a period of weeks and months actually into brain cells. We don't have as many of them in the end, which is why it's more difficult if we were to do the whole screen in them, but to look at compounds having a positive effect, then they are an ideal model. And then secondary, we can also look at brain cells taken from mice that have the same genetic changes in Parkin and in LARP2 as those in the patients. Once we've verified that the drugs are having a positive effect in the brain cell models, then we need to decide which drugs have the best effect. And importantly, we need to make sure that we're in the same dose range as the doses that are already in clinical use, because the safety data only applies to the dose range which is already in clinical use. If we wanted to use 10 times more drug, then we would have to go through the safety trials the same as a new drug. So that's a really important point, not that we get to this stage, and then it turns out actually we need to use it at 10 times higher and we've circumvented our drug repurposing strategy. And eventually then, uh, can we actually to get them to test in Parkinson's patients to see whether they really do have a beneficial effect. <laughs> Mitochondria sit in every single cell of our body and I've drawn them here on this cartoon. They generate most of the cell's energy. There's a huge evidence built up that mitochondria are not what I really want to talk about in the next uh, 30 minutes is the importance of how we can think about delivering that medicine to the right part of the brain.